Thank everyone for coming here tonight on behalf of the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and the Friends of the Refuge. My name is Kate Murray. I'm on the board of the Friends. And um, for those of you who are here who appreciate the refuge for its natural beauty and the wildlife that it protects, um, I hope that you'll consider volunteering for us or um, becoming a friend of the refuge. Uh, the refuge friends right now are undertaking a fundraising project. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Hellcat Trail knows that the boardwalks are pretty old. Uh, they're wooden, they don't last very long under those conditions, and the refuge, uh, those trails were designed 40 years ago. The refuge is a little more than halfway through designing replacement trails that I'm happy to say will be accessible trails, and I'm hoping that they get built before I need my walker. <laughs> so um, I just uh, would encourage you to think about making a contribution to that project. I'm very excited tonight to introduce Victor Maston. Victor is the Director and Chief Archaeologist for the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. <laughs> Did I get it right? That's correct. Okay. I wouldn't pick that title. Okay. <laughs> well, um, and some of you may recognize him because from time to time you'll see his photo in our local papers, perhaps over at the Damon, the wreck that's off of Cranes Beach, or up on Salisbury Beach. Um, with both shipwrecks and these weird imprints in the, the ocean side um, several months ago. Um, he's been doing this for over 30 years. Imagine how much, much fun it must be to solve puzzles looking at historical clues that have been found on our shore and under our ocean surfaces. So i um, very interested to hear what Victor has to share with us tonight, and I hope you join me in welcoming Victor Masco. So to just to give you a little more introduction about myself, I am a North Shore boy. I'm in the house that I grew up in, not because I wanted to be there, but that's the way Will's, not Will's, because it's not at that point now, but um, that's just the way life goes. I started out as an archaeologist back in the mid-70s, and I considered being paid. Once I got a paid job, I was a professional. It didn't matter what I did. Uh, so I've been doing this for, for over 40 years, and I've done terrestrial as well as maritime. Maritime was just a good gig that came up at the right time when I needed a job, and I'm very pleased that I got picked for that job. But having looked at all the resumes, technically I was the only one qualified. So that's the way life is. But any event, uh, I also do work in the refuge. Uh, we, we sort of informally partner with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service on their property, so I will mention a few sites here or a site when we get to it. Uh, so don't be surprised. I like to start this talk, and this is a little different. You also can see that there's a missing part of the title if you really look at it closely. Yes. Uh, it's our hidden history. Uh, it was my cut and paste to put it back on this morning when I wanted to up this a little bit, up the show. Uh, but I'd like to start with this slide of the 80K Damon over it. It's actually at Steep Hill Beach. It can show you how old this slide is uh, because we sort of get more local as you get, get longer doing this. But what I like about this slide, and you see that specifically we put dates on it. And typically I won't put a date down on, on a slide. But you see that the 80K Damon was a schooner built in Essex in 1875, had a long fishing career and then became, I guess what they call them, a sand dogger. They come up here to Plum Island because Plum Island sand, the silica content of Plum Island sand was one of the best silica contents for making cement, plaster, and, and certain other material like that. And so it was highly desirable and free. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she, on her way up here, and I'm gonna use she because I was trained traditional, so I really sound sexist, but it's not meant to be. Uh, she was on her way up here, hit the bar on the outside on Christmas Eve because they're anxious to make money and got pushed in by a storm in 1909. Total wreck. By total means they couldn't get it off the beach. They took everything off and you can see it pretty stripped there, 1909. By 1911 it stripped more, but it's changed its life. It's not a fishing vessel. Now it's entertainment, recreation. People having a picnic. The estate had its annual Ipswich picnic down there. By 1904, when I first heard about this, imagine I've been on the job since 787, and I didn't hear about this wreck until 2004. <laughs> well, we have 3,500 wrecks in Massachusetts, so it's understandable, at least from my perspective. Went out there, looked at it, 
disappeared within another season. We we're going to teach on that wreck with the trustees. Disappeared, and then in 2015, it came back out. What I'd like you to take out of these four photographs is look at Steep Hill. So you can see it, just a bit of it in the, in the top, uh, 1909. Pretty bald. Same in, in 1911, it's like almost clear cut. There's not really a lot of growth. And then as you come into the modern steep hill, it's heavily forested. And you can't really see it as well in these photographs, but the dunes are pretty extensive and high. And in the current dunes, they're pretty low. But also the wreck. The, the beach is different. That wreck is at a different angle to the beach that you go to. And so that beach, there's a coastal process that goes on, and whether or not that wreck's interfering with that process or it's um, it's benefiting from that I don't know but sometimes it's parallel to the beach sometimes it's almost perpendicular depending on the shape of steep hill beach so it does does change seasonally as well as over the long course well I want to start a little bit is talking about wrecking ships versus shipwrecks I'm going to talk to you about maritime archaeology first because I think you need to understand a little bit about where I come from in ter professionally in terms of really understanding the points that I want to make uh, wrecking ships that's what everyone thinks about is when they say shipwreck this picture on the left is what most people think about and what I really find amazing this is a local wreck see all these folks down here see that here's the wreck wicked wicked waves. This is Lynn Beach, so you know it's a fairly shallow beach, mm. uh, but really horrible. I don't believe this actually was pilot. I think this is just the artist taking little liberties, but what's really important, you see all these folks down here? You know why they're there? They're not there to help anybody. No. They're not there to, shall we say, salvage anything. Because that's what the first thought, we all didn't get anything came up. They had their for entertainment. This is 1802. This is the Vernon. What are you doing in Lynn? <laughs> There's nothing to do. <laughs> get down there watching the wreck. And this is very common. That people come down and watch the wreck and then they grab whatever they can, even though that's illegal then as it is today. Uh, but what I typically deal with is a picture on the right. An anonymous shipwreck. Only part of it. And my job is to figure out what vessel it is. And about 99% of the time, I'm going to tell you, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> or I think we all think we know what it is, and I look at certain pieces of evidence, and they'll say, absolutely can't be that vessel for certain components. This vessel I'm going to talk about a little bit later, it really intrigued us because it looked like, oh, wow, this is a really neat vessel. Here's the keel that's coming out on the beach, and it turns out this isn't the keel. So what's maritime archaeology? It's really any kind of archaeology that we use, it's either related to the marine or wet environment. So if I talk about maritime archaeology, marine archaeology, nautical archaeology, or underwater archaeology, it's all the same from the perspective of how you deal with it. For me, there's some nuances, but they're not critical. But it's really, it's really archaeology is just conducted in that medium. And there's different things we look at. So on the extreme left is Buzzards Bay, complete deep body of water today. 20,000 years ago, Buzzards Bay was a river valley. And this is a reconstruction done by USGS. So those are things that interest me. That, and we'll get into this sort of coastal process. Uh, diving, though I hate doing it myself now. It's, a, it's, it's wicked cold. I get kind of claustrophobic. And if my glasses, if I can't wear my glasses, I can't see. So it really takes, the, <laughs> takes a lot of pleasure out of diving. Uh, could not all things are shipwrecks, like you know, lighthouse. I'm going to talk about that up at the top. Aircraft, dealing with an aircraft now from World War II, off of Cape, Ann, uh, Cape Ann, off of um, Martha's Vineyard, Cape Hogue area. That's a training area. It's a training. Is that the aircraft we're dealing with? This isn't from there. That's actually from Buzzards Bay. Another trainer. This one, the pilot survived. The one we're dealing with now was a catastrophic event. We believe the pilot and, and gunner were. Uh, their bodies were claimed and buried, but we're not 100% sure. So that's some of that. But it could be wharfs, jetties, any any kind of structure that's in the water, whether it's uh, a vessel or not, is important to me as an archaeological resource. Um, types of underwater sites, well, shipwrecks, and here, this is what I deal with, type of shipwrecks. So in the top uh, left, that is 
the city of Rockland on Little Misery Island. We're actually going to take a field school out there this summer for a week and we'll do some documentation. That's a coastal freighter passenger vessel from the turn of the century to I think the 30s is when, when it finally um, bought the farm there. Ships Ways, looks like just logs in a river. This river is the North River in Norwell, probably about as wide as this room. 300 ton vessels were launched in that river. Not a perpendicular, not parallel, at an angle, at high tide. Uh, submerged terrestrial sites, so these are Paleo-Indian points. Not from Massachusetts, but we do have a site here in Bullbrook and Ipswich where they did find points like this, and they are found along uh, the Merrimack Valley. Our underwater buildings, we sometimes get old jetties, building foundations, and I'm gonna talk about a set of sites, but probably the most common thing to think about, think of Quabbin Reservoir. They may have taken all the buildings down, but if you side scan someone out of that and did some remote sensing, you'd actually see the foundations for the buildings there because they didn't backfill loads. They left those open. But not all underwater sites and maritime sites are underwater in the end. Uh, in the Seaport District two years ago, uh, uh, they're constructing the, ba uh, the foundations for one of the new towers at about I don't think it's 150, it's probably 120 Seaport Boulevard. And as the construction crew is excavating, they see all this white powder. They get a little nervous because typically white powder, it's not what you encounter, what do you encounter? And they start thinking asbestos and be a hazardous waste site. At the same time, their construction headquarters in the, is in the eighth floor of the adjacent building and they're looking down and they find that it's a lozenge-shaped white stain. And then as they look, when they go down and look at it closely, it's encased by wood. What it actually was was the outline of a vessel. It's a lime schooner carrying lime. Uh, what most people don't know is that lime, that white powder. We probably know what lime is. When I talk to a school group today, if I say lime, all they can think about is putting that wedge in a drink. <laughs> They have no idea that it's that white powder that gets thrown on your lawn. It's that same material. Lime and salt water are not friendly companions. Once they get together, you get extreme heat, which causes spontaneous combustion. This vessel burnt to the lowest part of the, of the vessel, below the water line. But they took no ballast. Lime schooners took only cargo. They, lo they load the kegs, the kegs are probably about this large, maybe about this round, and all we found was the very last layer of half kegs. It had burned and finally been completely inundated, so there's no oxygen to keep the, the process going. Uh, and they all had um, cast, usually have labels on them, but painted stencil. We got Rock Alf, and that's Rockland, Maine, and that was the main export port in New England for lime. Oh. Closer to home here is a uh, tide mill. People don't realize how, we think, when we see mills, we might think of the jewel mill down here on uh, Route 1 in Raleigh, when it used to be the jewel mill. I remember that. But people don't think of mills, they think of water wheels. They don't really think of tidal power or tidal energy. Almost every creek on Cape Ann had a tide mill. It could be as narrow as it could be, there's enough energy generated from tidal flow. This is uh, on Walker's Creek. Uh, it's usually where the clamors park their trucks before they go out to the flats. If you follow that path down, you come to a lot of stone in the middle of the, of the creek. That's the remains of the, of the mill and dam that was there. It was a lumber mill. Or another structure is a fishweir on the Satucket River in East Bridgewater. There's a, there's a Native American fishweir. It's like fish mill before, I'm sorry. That dates from the beginning of Plymouth Plantation and back a few hundred years at least. We have not dated it clean, but that was a Native American uh, fish mill. They, we capture alewife, eel was very common, trap uh, and uh, fish, uh, shad, um, was the, all the same species we go after today, 10,000 years ago they were still there. But that was an area that, that um, fish were still there today and it's actually found in deeds from Plymouth Colony, dividing the area. So it gives us a little clue into the past. Uh, finding sites, it's not just, I just don't go out and serendipitously find things, we tend to survey. Uh, I just wanna show you this image, mostly because this was an unknown shipwreck site, uh, we thought it was unknown. 
It was found during the LNG uh, pipeline survey several, uh, more than a decade ago. But we use a lot of technology in underwater archaeology. That's <coughs> how we differ from land archaeology for the most part. In this case, we have the big blue stain, our uh, pentagonal structure of the vessel, with the technology today that we can know where our boat is. That red circle with a cross is the ROV, this remotely operated vehicle down here. Oh, got this. So the ROV is this instrument here. This is our former assistant when I was, uh, that's why I'm chief, because I had an assistant. Yeah. He's now works from New Hampshire. Uh, and we could actually take this and we can set up systems so we can actually go over racks systematically, like we do on land on a land site. So that ROV would go back and forth, in theory, along those straight lines. In reality, no, 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 it doesn't happen. They're like currents or nervous operators, because ROV operators are always worried about losing the equipment. I see, you got an insurance policy. Who cares, but they don't like that talk. But anyway, they, during this survey, they found a vessel, and when they were surveying the vessel, he got close up at one point, and got, we captured this one image on the video. And you see that bottom right image, the shiny chain and new line? Don't expect to find that on a shipwreck, especially an old wooden wreck. We expect to see rusty chain and really gnarly, colonized, tatted ropes. Well, that's brand new rope that goes up to a lobster pot with a number on it. Uh, but we still didn't know what the vessel was, but we, we knew that this was purposely chained, because usually you don't use chain on your, on your pot, on, on the traps. And it turned out that gentleman who registered, registered to, it was an expired registration, but they keep those records forever. Lived a half a mile from me, had his phone number, gave him a call, and he was surprised we knew who he was. Meaning, I knew he was. I found out through the environmental police. I just asked them to run the numbers for me. And anyway, he gave me the coordinates, and it turned out to be the Breton Reef Lightship. And why is Breton Reef off of Rhode Island? What's that lightship doing here? It was on its way to Beverly to be turned into a restaurant in the 60s. And he had turned it into a recreational dive site. But to get the sense is we do very systematic survey work. We have to do a lot of investigation to determine whether it's a valuable site. Is it important? Is it something that needs to be elevated for greater protection, or whether it is um, just an old wreck that doesn't have any historical or archaeological value? What's not good in this picture, and I should have added, is they become they also become habitats. There's some beautiful sea anemone gardens out there. They love wooden shipwrecks. What uh, because Typically, most people think, I'm gonna, I, I want to find this, I want to find these. The Vasa or all the, I can't think of the name of that, uh, Viking ship, but, or Norse ship. But we never find intact vessels. We, we tend to find stuff. And in this case, this is the, just the sort of material that came out of the ocean from different sites. Uh, shoe leather from a war, uh, Revolutionary War wreck. Uh, Nails from another wreck from the same period, so copper, copper nails. Uh, this bottom left-hand piece, uh, what I want you to see here is, you see the top and then you can see the bottom. Uh, we, it was a mystery piece for us for a little while, because it's about this big. So too small to be a chamber pot and too big to be most of the things we think about. Uh, are just random stuff that comes off of George's bank when they're dragging for scallops. And you can see this sort of temporal variety. A lot of wooden sheaves of ships. Those are part of the pulley system on your block and tackle. The tap and the blocks are gone, but the sheaves are still there. Uh, oil can, part of a Chianti bottle, so we know that's really not ancient. Uh, plate from a steamer. Didn't want to do the dishes. <laughs> Off it goes. What I find interesting about this piece, and it's hard for people to identify. I should have brought it, because I was actually at the lab today. It's about this big. We, we had to use the maker's mark. So that's, that's sort of a date stamp maker's mark. You see when you buy you know, China today, and you know those change over time, just like advertising logos. So by looking at that, we could date it, got to a catalog, and finally figured out what it was. It has two handles. It looks like it had a lid, but the lid wasn't on the rack. And that actually came off a lime, school, a lime schooner as well. That's irrelevant to what it is. What might anyone guess? Something about a vessel about this big ceramic was. 
It's, it's not a chamber pot. This is Batum. No. Sort of in the same category, going the opposite way. It's a sugar bowl. A lot uh, of sugar. Because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm thinking about, when I got the catalyzed, it's sugar bowl, and I'm looking at the, I'm thinking, sugar bowl, yeah. My mom's got sugar bowls. They're this big. No, it's for lump sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's what you'd get in 1910. You wouldn't get in granulated sugar. You're getting a lump. Uh, also, you see, objects can tell us a lot about what what they made up. I won't read all this, but there are clues. We look at the things to help us determine what we found, what it might, where it might be going, where it came from. Sometimes about the people that are involved. I have to get into my cheat sheet now because now we're getting into the part of the script that's a little bit new. Mm -hmm. So now we're getting to the topic at hand. Can can uh, can you find out? What can we find out? from the past about the present. Uh, Pleistocene megafauna, that's the technical term for prehistoric mammoths, mastodons, sloths, uh, tiger, uh, saber-toothed tiger, those big animals that lived on Earth probably 100,000 to 40 to 20,000 years ago and then disappear. Well, off of nearby, this is brought from a, a, another archaeologist, Dr. Stephen Clayson, he's been doing research on trying to get fishermen to tell him where they find tusks, teeth, bones. Well, he has two, um, a mammoth and mastodon tooth found on the delta for the Merrimack River. So just north of here, or just, and just east of us here. Oh. And that talks about, to me, that talks about a period of time between 20 and 10,000 years ago. In this case, they would date at one of these, uh, the top left, um, Mammoth tooth was dated to 1350, 13,500 years before today. Uh, the one on the bottom, so you get a mammoth, mastodon tooth, not dated, but fits that same period. And then there's another mastodon tooth off of a fountain, off a of province town about 25 miles out. Dragon just pulls it up, these guys collect them. We don't, even if they're in state waters, we just want to know where. We just don't, we don't want them. I mean, I'd love to have one for the office. So you go and give a school program, you bring it. And I believe in letting people touch real objects. I don't believe in making them sacred and don't touch them because that sort of gets people interested in collecting. Uh, but a lot of, there's a market for this. It's a lot of draggers will collect that if they're interested and it's then off to the sale, now on eBay, but yes. not always. But anyway, they, we're talking about when the area offshore that's not at the bottom at 90 feet, 100 feet was dry land. It was, there was so much dry land at a certain point that what you have is a process going on of, of landscape being preserved. So we have an offshore landscape with the, that those teeth and bones suggest to us. And then as you get closer, you get a landscape that appearing in modern times, it's really ancient. And what we have here are what we call the remnants of sunken forests. And you hear about it every once in a while, usually not in our area. But they'll talk, they'll talk oh, in, in Europe they found this ancient forest in, in the North Sea. Well, this is the same thing. These are, tr these are cedar tree trunks. Cedar is a freshwater coastal species versus a saltwater species. And we've got actually three that I know of, sunken forests in Massachusetts. You don't, I don't have the map that shows all of them. So, Long Beach on the Rockport, uh, Gloucester Line, there's a sunken forest there, then in Duxbury, and then down South Cape, and that's what I'm showing you here. And if you look really closely, and if you can hear me, I hope my voice carries. So there's peat coming out of the sand, but right above it, there are the tree trunks. Mm -hmm. There's about 40 of these. I just don't have a good image that I can show you of them. Uh, this is work by Dr. Chris Mayo, who's now up at the University of Alaska. Uh, but what Chris had done radiocarbon dating on these and found them to be about 1,280, maybe, a little bit earlier. Yeah. And they had that common, and probably based on where they are on the shoreline, it's the same thing. But it's a process, and I, we'll talk a, I'll talk a little bit more later about it. Um, essentially, you have the dune, the four dunes that we have out on the, the beach. Behind the dunes, you usually have a marshy area like we have here with a huge estuary. But it's saltwater intruding. At one point in time, it was a huge estuary that was just fresh water. 
And as sea level rises and salt water intrudes, it changes the environment. And if you look at this top image, you can see the dead trees of dead cedar in a swamp that used to be fresh water. It's now salt because of sea level rise. And in these cases, not only is sea level rise, but the four beach is gone. And that's the case here. I'm going to talk a little bit later about Salisbury. And we looked at, I recently looked at a, a white, white beach in Manchester where the four beach is gone. But the, you can see the outer Granite Islands. But the current beach was actually the back shore of a freshwater pond. And that's what you had here. This freshwater pond, this was like that 1,200 years ago. So you get these things, clues that tell us about the locale, uh, our, our greater uh, processes that are going on. Uh, now, I, I sort of mentioned the clay beds, and um, uh, two people had gotten in touch with me, uh, Bill, Bill Sargent and, and Sandy Tilton, and said, come on, I, we found horseshoe prints. And it's kind of cool because I didn't want to drive down to the ones in East Ham that came out in March. I said, I hate going to the Cape. I don't like Cape Ann, I just don't like Cape Cod. The, oh, I said that on tape, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things where most of the time I get called, about a week after something is found, the tides have changed and the sand has come back in and I've made a trip for nothing. So I didn't go down. When they called me and they said, hey, you know, we've got this. I, Immediately, I had to find time to get out there, and we did. And, and this is a picture, is, I think, these are both, these might all be Bill's photographs, but I'm not sure. Uh, but you can see the, clearly the horseshoe prints. Probably mid to late 19th century on a clay bed, not a peat bed. Uh, most likely not doing it, probably working on salvage off the beach. Not this, the four beach that you see today was the four beach that we had two or three hundred years ago. That that the beach when that this clay bed was part of a pond is probably about a thousand to fifteen hundred years ago or earlier. That are later than that. Um, but what they, they what they intrigued me with is the, the, the prints that they found, and it was really cool because we're talking about the, you can see the set of prints in the bottom picture, parallel tracks. I'm looking at them when they first called. They looks like tractor tracks. It's a there's only one set, and there's no place else in that area where there's a second set. And Sandy looks, all, looks like someone walking backwards. And if you're taking horses on a, and you're dragging something, usually you're not walking this way. You're usually walking backwards. It made perfect sense. And then Bill and I talked quite a bit about what was there. And Bill said, you know, behind Crane Estate in the dunes, there are old cranberry bogs. And those are clay bottoms on most of those bogs. And it just makes sense that this is probably the environment that was there at the time, as opposed to a freshwater swamp, you've got a, a, a freshwater bog for cranberries. And it just sort of gets you that what change is going on here. But also change isn't, oh, I guess I changed the order. Uh, also, some of the change we see is what's different on a beach. So they noticed footprints in the clay. This beach, was large stones, so say uh, two gallon bucket sized stones on a beach that was completely sand. Wow. What were they doing there? So we went out to look and most likely they had been brought later in probably the late 19th, early 20th or mid 20th century to make a fire pit. But as we walked the beach, we found the, the evidence of ancient Native American habitation of that area so that we got a nice lens above the, gra the glacial tills and below the sands. So we didn't, we didn't actually collect up with this, we saw no diagnostic artifacts, so we didn't see any projectile points, arrowheads, or scrapers. We saw some stone like this bottom piece that looks like it's been pecked a little bit, but it was in situ. We, it's not diagnostic for age, so we just left it in place, and it's in a state park, so it shouldn't be collected. But again, coastal process is eroding and exposing these sites because of sea level rise. Or here, so the reverse. I'm going to show you this in another photograph and another image. If you notice that the wood planks, that's actually part of what we think is what they call a, um, it's a double ender type vessel. Why uh, oh, I just blanked and I didn't write it in my notes because I know it by heart. A gundalo. So if you go up to Portsmouth, 
strawberry bank, there's a gun, there's a, actually, you can ride on the gondola. Those are ubiquitous colonial trading, but not trading, it's like cargo craft <laughs> or, or barges. Well, this is probably part of a gondola. Notice how much marsh is above it. And this is in the, in the North River, and um, there's actually a shipbuilding site right above here. You get several feet of marsh. I couldn't get in there. That marsh was so punky and soft. And when you're working by yourself or with one other person, many times you don't want to get into that, that mire. But we got down, we could see that it had those are wooden trunnels, uh, tree nails, or pegs as you might call them right here. Those aren't iron. Uh, the way it's put together, we're pretty certain that that's a colonial period one. But what, I'm, what you notice is how much marsh is built up above the wreck. And here, it's even we can even date one. Now, this isn't a wreck. This looks like a, a log. You're going down the Essex River, you see this log. And you don't see logs in a marsh all the time. Well, if you're someone who's doing research, and it wasn't me, it was a gentleman who's doing genealogical research, and he said, this is coincidental that I'm seeing this log right where I think there should be a bridge mm -hmm. in colonial period. And he went over and he looked at this and we went later and he had um, mortise and tenon joinery in that log. That log on the side that was visible from the water, oh yeah, it's round, looks like the bark's all off it. When you got up close, you could see it had been adds flat on both sides. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the bottom right, it's the puddings, how puddings would fall for sort of a medieval a colonial bridge. There wasn't a lot of engineering changes. This, this is ancient Roman technology that just keeps going forward. Uh, that bridge dated to 1665, and it was knocked out in an ice, a, a, a bad ice storm in the winter, just river flow ice just pulled it out, destroyed it. The upside for the people of Shabaco, or Essex Village, was the fact that they no longer had a walk to Ipswich to go to church on Sundays. Mm -hmm. They could get their own parish. And they had been arguing for a parish and evidently they had divine intervention and that stone pulled out the bridge, isolating them from Ipswich, then forcing the question of developing their own meeting house. So it has a serendipitous or positive effect, but notice again the building of the marsh above it. Certainly that sinks into the, into the substrate, but it's not going to sink about four feet into the substrate. A couple of feet maybe, most likely not, because you, the cribbing, in a sense, is partially buoyant, just the way the structure's built. Well, we're on that sort of change in that environment. I, I bring this image in, this is a dugout canoe from Lake Winsigamon, uh, mainly because this vessel is now, a tw there's three of them at 26 foot depth in, this, in Lake Winsigamon. They weren't sunk to be at 26 feet. These, what the ancient Native Americans did is they, when they made a dugout canoe for the winter period, because it takes so much labor to create it, they actually sunk them over the winter. And then in the spring, they would take the stone out and retrieve it. Obviously, these weren't retrieved, but they're not free diving at 26 feet when you've got a thermal climb with a surface water of 60, and at 10 feet, it goes down to 38. From personal experience, I will tell you it is not a very comfortable change. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any event, this lake has either, several things have taken place here. The lake has been dammed so that the, the water level has risen. So you have that change to the environment. Uh, the vessels could have slid down because on the end of a, two of them are on the end of a slope. One is not, so it kind of gets away from the theory of being put at six feet too far to the edge and winter ice kind of pull them out and drop them. Uh, or they could have been purposely sunk deep for non-retrieval. This one that you see, radiocarbon dated to 1660, which is roughly when they were doing Christianization of the Indians in that area. So Plymouth Colony was sending out uh, an Elliot to, to do that. What I love about this image, you see, that's not the visibility. The two on the, on the right are what we would see. I'd see about three feet if I was really lucky in a dive on this site. So we did a photo mosaic, we had a volunteer did a photo mosaic, and he got the entire vessel in 40, in 40 images over, with about a 75% uh, percent overlap. What's really cool to me, and you might actually see it in this one, it's a nice bottle in there. It's green, they drink Heineken. I realized that, that the, they, they were trading with the Dutch and they were having Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that. 
Uh, but it's cool that we see all these rocks, and that one that looks like a skull is not a skull. That really intrigued us because we dro had the drop camera go down and look at it, and it's like the diver goes, comes back up, it's just a rock with some really odd holes. <laughs> uh, but it actually has seats cut into it. Uh, what's kind of fun is you get the archaeologist who goes down and does a nice drawing, and then we get the image of photographs, and they don't quite match. But we're not sure. When you take 40 photographs and try to make them into one big photograph, the computer program, it likes to manipulate the data so that things meet. So we don't know if that curve is actually natural, that's what's happening, or whether the software has decided to manipulate the image and give us this nice curve to, to fill in the voids. Uh, here's some think about storm action. This looks like, tr again, tree stumps. And it's actually back in that, that image I showed you, that's that same marsh. Those aren't tree stumps. We, we, we were fortunate to go out with the naturalists from the, this is the Wakoi Bay Natural Marine Research Reserve down in Mashpee. Their, their chief scientist was doing some work out there and he said, I think I found a shipwreck. So we go out with them and sure enough. And he knew it because it's kind of the shape and he found the copper spike and an iron, and an iron spike as well. That was inapplicable. There was no opening that we can find a historic map to bring in boats in there. So what's it doing in there? Only the logical thing is flat enough area that it's overwash. And our, when we're doing study of the sunken forest, they can find these really fine layers of sand every once in a while, showing severe storm action. So you get an overwash, something gets dragged from the offshore and just pushed up and in. This is a half a mile from the beach today. Probably when it was deposited, it was probably more like a mile. So you get that flow, that king tide, or even a storm surge, and that's what they were getting. Again, that pushed in. We still can't figure out what vessel is. I can't find a wreck listed off of that area. We have a few places like that. But talking about storm action, and we think about today, think about this year, all the March storms. 1851, very similar problem. Minus Ledge Lighthouse. Anyone knows what Minus Ledge is off of Situate, Cohasset? It's a nice, beautiful granite lighthouse. And you get these photographs from this Blood of 78 when the waves are going crashing over the top. Well, that was the second lighthouse. The first one was a steel tower with legs open. They thought this was a great design. The British were talking about doing, they have a similar semi submerged stone called Eddy Stone Rock. They're going to put a lighthouse out there. They were talking about doing this in the 1840s. They decided against it. We, on the other hand, said, oh, they weren't going to use the idea, we'll use the concept. <laughs> so we, they built a lighthouse and it took them about five years to actually construct it because you can only work a couple of weeks a year on the rock to drill the holes, to put the footings in mm -hmm. for the tower. Unfortunately, the tower was not a very stable component. Uh, pretty rocky. And I think what I find interesting and Maybe it's just me, but you see this rowboat, uh, the longboat? Very similar to the one in the other picture. <laughs> it's not identical, but there's a whole other story. If you look at the genre of postcards and photographs that are used for historic vessels, we have a wreck called the Jason in Truro. And there's a nice picture of it, totally wrecked. It's a disaster wreck. I love to use it as one of my opening slides. I've seen the same photograph attributed to a wreck in North Carolina, <laughs> South Carolina, Florida, and California. So manipulation is, is not unusual, but notice how the waves are coming up, and notice how it, it actually tumbles the, uh, the tower. Well, in March of 1851, the second keeper, the first keeper, Mr. Dunham, lasted 10 months and just quit. Absolutely did not want to be the lighthouse keeper out there. The new keeper, Bennett, and his two assistants, um, Antoine and Swift, were out there. And it was a March storm came up in 1851, and he put a message in the bottle. I'm just going to read you the very end of his message. If it's God's will, I will die in the performance of my duty. That's how fearful he was of the storm action. About a month later, maybe three weeks later, on April 17th, he was on shore, but the other two keepers were there. They had a much more cryptic note that they left in a, in a bottle. The lighthouse, oh God, I have to keep taking these off. And I have bifocals in here. Uh, the lighthouse won't stand over the night. It shakes two feet in every direction. 
and it went. And the bodies were found the next day and the day later, a good distance from, one was close in Cohasset, the other was up towards, I think, Hull. When they went back to survey later, this is all they could see of the lighthouse. The bit of the, 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 the uh, legs were still there, they snapped, they were cast iron, and some of the structure. And I just like to notice the mariners because it, it mentions the fact that it disappeared. I would not want to be on that light ship that they put there for the next 10 years while they built the other light, lighthouse because that's a pretty rough area. Mm. Now come back to that wreck I showed you at the very beginning, wrecking ship versus shipwreck. Yeah. So we went out to look at this with the Park Service back in uh, 2007. And this is beach erosion as well as storm action. Most of the time you're going to see wreckage on the beach and you're thinking, oh, it's just uncovered. And that's usually not the case. Usually the case is that it's probably from about 300 feet to 300 yards offshore. Wave, wind, and surge picks up that piece of wood and pushes it, all that wreckage, up on the beach. And I'm going to show you another piece of wreckage in a minute. But uh, So this wreckage probably went the same way because we've got other images of it. We can see how it, it's not in the same position and so on. But we went out and looked at it, and we were just puzzled. A local shipwreck expert author had given it the name, he believed it was a ship called the Lyman Law. So we looked at the Lyman Law, talked to some other researchers, and what his research failed to do, he didn't do his due diligence, that three weeks later the Lyman Law was refloated, brought to Boston for repairs. So we know it's not the Lyman Law. Also, we thought it was the keel, and it's easy, because you look at things, your mind has an image of what wreckage should look like. In this case, it, we were puzzled. And it didn't help that when the Park Service went down and their architectural historian did the, I love the Bash Park Service. When the architectural historians went down, they got, they got some of the wood in there. They knew where the pieces were, but we had none of the fastenings. And fastenings were, the, were how they put together is the clues that archaeologists look and shipbuilders look to talk about where you are on the vessel and how it's built. Uh, they didn't note that it's been repaired. So you see that nice repair in, that, in, the, uh, in the planking, in the outer planking. But when we started excavating and got in on some of the uh, ribs or frames, we noticed these nice little grooves. And we found out, oh, those are limber holes. That allows water to go back and forth along the, along the, through the ballast. So we were just above the keel. The keel had been gone, and this is a pretty massive, but really flat-sided vessel, probably part of a barge. So now we have to, we haven't found a barge lost in that area, but it sort of fits that. But that sort of, again, for us, it's exposed to storm action and most likely brought from an offshore wreck, or nearby offshore wreck, onto that spot. Uh, other things to think about for coastal process, and what we, we look at, here's, a, here's another wreck through a series of um, side-scale images over two years. Different images show up because of sand movement. And people tend to think about the beach changing over the seasons, if they're really knowledgeable about that, that process. But it also happens in deep water. So at 150 feet, you're still seeing this movement of sand, this transport. And in fact, that the 2003 image, you really don't even see it, because the sand waves have completely obstructed it. You see the sand waves in here a lot. And there are some, what we call, artifacts of the side scan sonar lines being put together. Unknown vessel off of South Beach, the South Beach, Martha's Vineyard, not South Beach, Cape Cod. Um, and we don't have a good, any better image than this, so we'll probably never know except it's probably a wooden vessel based on its overall shape. Now I talked about movement along the beach, we talked about <laughs> underwater. This piece of wreckage in 2015 popped out, up, up above, um, not quite where this, where the uh, horseshoe uh, prints were, but in the same general vicinity, so near lot, uh, Access Road 7. And we went out to look at it, and the first reaction was, this is from the Jenny Carter. Well, first, the currents run the opposite way in this portion of, uh, of the shoreline, so it's not going to get pushed north by any imagination. But also, the Jenny Carter's been pretty beat for over 150 years. Well, not quite 150, but pretty beat. So the upper, upper deck forces or upper sides of the, of the vessel don't exist. Uh, and what was fun for me on this, and I should have it in another image as well, is when we got up there we could see the water line on this piece of wreckage. Oh, 
the lesson here though is that long section that you see coming out, somebody decided they needed that more than nature and they cut them off and oh. brought them home. Hopefully they made nice furniture or something out of them, not just used it for just having wood. Um, but that piece of wood migrated down the beach and went from Access Road 7 over the course of that year, or those, those months, got hidden in the summer. We went out, you couldn't find hybrid hair of it in July. And we knew roughly where it should be based on our GPS. So it came back out in October, and a nice um, uh, drone image of it, uh, done by Stephen Clayson again. And then we watched, and then in January, it was up on the roads by sea glass. We believe that nature didn't bring it there, that probably someone that owned property there, who will remain nameless, uh, probably removed it up there so it wouldn't damage their piles to their building. But in any event, that's now in the park over here at Salisbury Reservation. But it's kind of neat that it moves, and eventually it'll, it'll end up roughly offshore again. It would have eventually been dragged out. But we do get some clues that we, we know it's the midships of a vessel. We know it's above the, it's above the bilge, but below the deck level. Um, but nature also changes the shoreline a lot. And in 2014, 15, a wreck showed up in Coffins Beach. Unbeknownst, no one there, we could get a collective memory that went back about 85 years, no one ever saw a wreck on that beach. But we did research, came up with um, a couple of gill netters that had burned on that beach in the general vicinity. So we got out figuring we're going to go look at a gill netter. As we started to look at it and started to, to do the drawings, the drawing doesn't, this image is very poor. Uh, but when we did our outline, we could see how blunt the vessel was. And gill netters are not blunt vessels, they, they get a nice sort of pointy bow, that's for the best way to describe it to me, but this has got a really blunt bow and shallops and then Shabako boats in particular have this kind of design. And we're still pretty much convinced it's on that early end, by early anywhere from probably the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812 period. I'm always hoping it's earlier because I want to find something really old besides things I can buy in the store. And we did look at it, we found some interesting features on it that sort of confirmed that we think it's earlier but had a long life. First we saw the draft marks. We got a Roman six up in the top left and then the top right we're using a GoPro and cleaning out the sand a little bit. We got we could see a Roman five on that bow on the stem of the vessel so we know that we have the draft marks and this style of Roman numerals is an earlier period as you got into the 19th century they went to regular numbers you know, European Arabic numbers. So we know that it falls from that date period, uh, that, so that earlier se section. Also, all the planking was large, uh, wide. It was, and very, it still had, it had, this had obviously been buried a lot because it still was not punky, it was still very firm. But if you look in this bottom left, I'm gonna go and sort of point out the features on it. So this is the stem. So you see that, there's a side view of the profile, and this is sort of a top view. That's one piece of wood. So you get 15 inches, 15 inches. It's cut out here. This vessel did not have a bowsprit when it was first built. There's a transition in shallops and schooners from going to having, I mean, and it changes again later, having no bowsprit to having a bowsprit added. And that's what happened on this vessel. Then the fun things. So archaeologists, we all say we're all systematic. Well, get kind of frustrated and we're trying to find the keel because we know we have the vessel. We can't find the stern. We think it's actually probably broken off. But we're reaching down and we're right at the low tide interface at an extreme like a negative one to two foot low tide. And we still are just backfilling with water. We can't get in. So we stop reaching through that sand into the ballast, or hope to find the ballast, and we pulled out hard corals. Mm -hmm. And coral is both a ballast material and a cargo. Usually if it's cargo, it's sort of cut, lumpy, sort of squared lumps. If it's ballast, it's usually found off the beach and it's usually rounded cobbles. This is brain coral. Brain coral 
is Caribbean. It's mm -hmm. not even, you know, Florida. Which it's far in the Caribbean, and there's a huge trade between sort of the North Shore, Salem, to Suriname in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking this may be, and they used open shallops, open shabaco boats. Uh, so these guys, these people are really tough. I couldn't go that far in an open boat. Uh, so we, we, we think we've got something that could date there, but it's only because the beach has changed for a long enough period of time that this area opened up, that these longshore channels came open that we could find this vessel. So I it alluded earlier to the Jenny Carter and that other piece of wreckage. I just want I should, this got out of order. It's like when you're putting the slides in, I still do PowerPoint, like I'm making slides in the old projectors, so you have to bear with me. But I love that you can see the water lines. We knew we were in the vessel and then you see the Jenny Carter, which you can still go if you go up to Salisbury Beach and you get the low tide and you go by um, just south of the uh, sea glass. That's visible. That wreck is visible. It's a big wreck. It's 165 foot of a ship. Still into that. Uh, still the frames are there. These frames are not the same kind. Uh, they're both the same width, but they, they have got complete integrity. It, this, is, this is much more from a larger vessel. But just to give you an idea of things we see, the clues we get out of the wreckage, that even that driftwood, we might be able to find a certain, might not be able to do the DNA test, like, oh, it's from the Jenny Carter, or it's from the, the Lehman Law, uh, the Sir Francis, but I can tell the, what it might be from, and then I can narrow it down. And I'm gonna get to a, to a little bit of a story at the very end that goes with that. I talked about sea level rise without sort of alluding to it earlier. We actually have, the problem of inundation and loss of habitation sites in Massachusetts due to sea level rise. This is the town, the village of Billingsgate, Walfley. Disappeared in early 1900s, before 1910. Had a baseball team up until 1901. This, this is the, the lighthouse. The light was taken and moved to, I think it's Lake Michigan. The building was moved onto into Orleans, Chad, one of those towns. Come over here, there's the, the bell markers, but all these little dots, foundations from houses, still visible in the sands of this inundated site. So sea level rise wiped out this community that had been there since colonial period. Uh, we hope to get back out and do a little more research. I, I, I'm fascinated by, by the fact that I can still get out of low tide and look at it. A little bit of question whether who owns it, the state or the feds. I assert ownership. Because I can get away with it. <laughs> so that, that and that's, it's, it's probably a, be a fun story for me as a, as a as sort of a historian to get people to look at this site out there and then find the houses today and tie them back and forth. Because it's nice, you can, that it connects you to, to the past, but also connects people to the situation of what sea level rise can do. You have, you have a realization of that. So quickly in summarizing, and I, and I won't read this, I'm, rather I'm gonna talk about the images. Cause you can read that. It's just that's the usual, you know, academic stuff. This is the Elk site, as we call it. It's a light ship in the Merrimack River. They did have light ships in the Merrimack River. It's, um, I, I don't know if any of you know Lowell's Boat Shop, but this is Graham McKay from Lowell's Boat Shop in there. This is what he did his master's thesis on, this shipwreck. Uh, that tree is growing out of the wreck. The river goes around it. I just like it because it's listed as the light vessel model number one, or hull plan number one. It isn't. Hull plan number one is 110 feet long. This is an 80-foot vessel. We have bow and stern. These wooden vessels built in the 1850s were sold out in the 1920s and 30s, and nobody's going to take and cut a vessel down that period. They're going to either scrap it or use it. They're not modifying it heavily. This probably fits the LB5709, which was sold out in Boston. The LB1 was sold out in Savannah, Georgia. Again, why would you buy a boat down there and bring it up here? Graham probably right that it's a lighter, and two of those vessels were used as lighters because of these big tanks. This is the Minus Ledge Monument. We put this monument down. It's actually on land now because it came up its monument holding piece. But the other vessel at the end is the steamer Lutzen. 
And it recently exposed out in East Ham. And what's kind of cool about that vessel, its name in the newspapers was the Notorious Lutzen. Uh, it was a very successful rum runner. And also they had it down to a skill of how to get your vessel outfitted, use it, and not pay any of your bills, and then have it set up for auction, and then buy it back. <laughs> it's all self-reading the Bahamas, the Bermuda Papers rather. It had a murder on it. Um, I think the first mate had to shoot one of the crew who was going, quote, going to attack him. Probably was a dispute over um, shares. But it eventually, after prohibition, it still kept freighting out of, out of Canada. Ran, ran aground there carrying a cargo of frozen blueberries yeah. in the 1930s. I didn't even know we had a trade, there was a trade in frozen blueberries. I mean, it's sort of unusual, but they offloaded that cargo very quickly. So I always have that speculation. Was there something else on that vessel that they didn't want anybody to know about, but that blueberry cargo story really gets everybody's interest and distracts them? So with that, I'll bring this to a close. And counting history might be a walk on the beach. This is the Ingomar down here. About uh, a good hard walk below parking lot three. <laughs> I hate doing that walk, <laughs> carrying gear. I really hate it, but I, it's a, it's a, to me, it's my art shot in the bottom. And What's neat about this wreck is everybody knows Ingemar. I have to be a doubting Thomas. That's the way I'm trained. I go out, Ingemar, I think, is 110 to 120 feet long, and all I have to see is 80 foot of wreck. <laughs> and now they break it. Wrecks break up, and I could show images of broken wrecks. But the way it was laid out on the beach, it looked like an 80-foot wreck. Then a few years ago, we went out, and, and Graham came down, because Graham actually sits on our board. He was my intern, and then you know, I was my oversight board member. Uh, we went down with some students, and we're looking at it, and there was one piece that looked like a mast. And it's just like, boy, this is really beat. But beyond that, we saw more material. And it fit the length of the Ingemar. And then we knew that Ingemar had a transom stern. And Graham was looking at what we thought was the mast. And he goes, just shook his head, looked at us. And he said, this is the rudder post. You can see here where the gear would fit right in. And everything lined up. And then we can confirm it's the Ingemar. The other two vessels are so much smaller that it couldn't be them. There are two other vessels in that general vicinity. I mean, they go nameless right now. But it was nice to finally confirm what would be an anonymous wreck and a fun walk, thing to see in a walk, to say we know it's definitely that vessel. And with that, I'll answer any questions. If I don't know the answer, I can make one up to make you happy. I have some handouts here if you want them. If you don't, I won't be offended. Well, thank you very much. Boats that have been down for thousands of years right. and pull-ups. All that sexy stuff. <laughs> but there's just tons of movement. Yeah, well, here, I mean, what, what the whole coastal process, people don't even realize what goes on. I mean, I, even as being trained in, in the field, and as over time as I do more, coming out of doing ancient Native American prehistoric archaeology, you're doing ship and vessel archaeology um, for various reasons, it's that whole natural process, people don't realize that it's, yeah, there's a long-term process, there's a seasonal process, and it's very evident here. I mean, I go out to these beaches a lot, and I like to go out in the winter, mostly because most of the beach is gone. It's actually sand is just dragged out, so what I'm looking for is exposed. In fact, I have to come back here, I've got to talk to one of the uh, staff about going out to look at an anchor down below five, between five and six, if it's still exposed. And, and of course those plovers are out, you know, and I won't make any comments about them. But, uh, so I have to be escorted when I'm down there. But even looking at the images, I can't, I can't always tell what something's from. I can get a rough age, and maybe by that rough age say it might go to this vessel or that vessel. But when you look at these beaches, and especially in Massachusetts, 
we get 3,500 plus wrecks, probably a lot more. I got one list that's 5,600 that we got to play with. Uh, but anyway, most of those, majority of those vessels, I would say 75%, and that's a rough estimate, are schooners from colonial period to the 20th century. And then the next biggest group is fishing vessels, many of which were abandoned versus you know, lost uh, as casualty. And so this, um, I'm just closing this as we talk. I lose my train. Um, the, the process of, to find those and identify them is really, it's not as easy as we think. Even with having lists, precision, what we want for precision today, people didn't want 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The, the communication, like us, we get our GPS, I love it. You know, I go out, take my pictures, I've got it, now I know where I am. Thank God, because I can have used a big GPS unit, I'm always screwing it up. Uh, but I can see change in some of these pieces over the years. Jenny Carter's pretty static to me, but there are times when it's more exposed and I can see some of the granite that it was carrying for cargo. Yeah, but it's where the beach changes a little bit. Um, we do beach nourishment that covers it up. We put beach armoring that covers it up. Not so much the wrecks, but it changes the way the sand moves. Well, look at here at the northern tip of Plum Island. You get that little bit of change with the, the jetty being replaced. And that was, I don't think, was an anticipated change. You know, so we have to look at all the natural forces and process to see what can happen with them. Has anybody attempted to come up with a plot of sea level level versus you know they, fixed they, yeah, stuff like some, that over say the last twenty thousand years? Yeah, there are some. There are a few maps out there. The, the scale is kind of what we call gross. It's kind of hard when you come down to the level of looking at. A locality yeah. because most of the time the data is driven by uh, nat co current contours which actually are, are, are today's contours they're not the contours in ancient times so you have to do a little more work they'll probably get more that plus sea level rise and glacial change there's a lot of different factors that are involved so for example we have what they call rebound so the glacier retreats, you get that void, but then the ground springs back, and then it sort of settles down a little bit. So you, they have to look at, on these rebound charts, where that area might be, and then it's really looking at cores. We have to really look at core samples to, to determine where we are. What would be a good place to go looking for that kind of data? I don't think there's any one good place. I, I'm actually just reading an article that's probably written 20 years ago I mean, not that long ago, by uh, Fitzgerald, and I can't remember who the rest are. But Duncan Fitzgerald out of Boston University has done a lot of local research uh, in terms of sea level rise. And um, I can't think of his first name, the last name is Odale out of Woods Hole, did a lot of research. And they're still refining these charts. We, we require this when they're doing um, cable work. Uh, for a lot, you know, like a big power cable coming down, or the LNG line, or for the wind farms, for their cables when they cross in the state waters. We're asking for reconstruction, but it's, again, it's a very narrow strip, but it does get a greater process, but it's someone to sit down and get some, and there's probably, there could be a, a dissertation or thesis out there, and most likely from BU, but I'm not sure, that sort of talks a little bit about that, so it's more that kind of sleuthing at a more academic level to find it. I know, I, I wish I had the time to do it. I find it fascinating, I've worked with a lot of um, geoarchaeologists now, students that are coming through the system that are more interested in that, these processes and also looking for the sites that are associated with them. Because I've always thought we'd find ancient Native American sites out on this, off our shores as well as in our rivers and lakes and ponds, but it's taken probably almost 20 years of my career before people started to accept that that's a possibility. I know it didn't really give you the source place to go, but... Other questions? Yeah. I can tell stories, you know. <laughs> know some fake <laughs> um, Some of the questions that you have in your mind, perhaps you want to hold on to them. And two weeks from tonight, Nancy Pow, who is the refuge's um, wildlife biologist, will be here doing a presentation on climate change and Plum Island. And so Nancy might be. Um, uh, 
more knowledgeable about some sources, Tom, that, that might be of interest to you. So I encourage you to come back here in two weeks and hear Nancy Powell. Thank you. Thank you.